I'm finally happy with how the Prusa XL is printing. In this video, we'll work through what it took, the results, and ask the question, would I recommend the XL to others? Like plenty of others, I was hit with buyer's remorse after finally getting my hands on the Prusa XL. But now, after jumping through some hoops and spending even more money, I'm pretty close to satisfied. So come with me as I take you along for the journey. My first video on the XL came out at the start of November 2023. In that video, I covered the unboxing, assembly, and initial calibrations required to get printing. I also went over how much this printer had cost me, which was a lot, and how frustrated I was by all of the delays. And as you can tell from the picture I used in the thumbnail, it didn't go well. This was my first multicolor print. As you can see, it suffered from lots of stringing and color blobs contaminating the print. And unfortunately, this was pretty typical, and I almost went insane trying to test this small four color fish, trying to match a reference example printed on a Bamboo Lab A1 Mini with AMS Lite. Other problems I had in that video were layer shifts, suspected to be caused by false positive crashes in the firmware, and then erroneous rehoming. I finished that video with a list of items that I thought were necessary to fix the XL, and some people responded by blaming me for using the alpha firmware, so I retested everything and same result. The following week, Prusa released a slicer update, which improved the logic for multicolor prints. This didn't cure the machine, but the results were definitely heading in the right direction. So what have Prusa done since then? As always, Prusa had been releasing updates, both in the form of firmware for the XL, and of course their slicer, Prusa Slicer, with new features as well as updates to the profiles for the various machines. They also updated the documentation, including information about XL specific G-code that I pointed out was missing in my first video. But perhaps the biggest change was in that of specification. Whereas mine and all of the other early XLs came with a 0.6 nozzle, Prusa officially changed to a 0.4mm nozzle, which is the default for most 3D printers. So, taking advantage of the sales around Black Friday, I ordered myself a set of 5. Even on sale, this still cost me $151, pushing my total over 8,000 Australian or 5,200 US. As you'll later see, these nozzles make a significant difference. In my opinion, myself and all of the other early adopters should have got these free of charge. Let me know if you agree with me in the comments section. I think we've paid more than enough for this printer, and it's a bit rich to expect us to pay more for new nozzles on top to bring the XL up to the correct specification. The other thing that happened was I was contacted by Shane from Prusa. This is the user same old Shane that you'll see frequently posting on the Prusa forums. And let me tell you, Shane is a great guy, and we're already acquainted from him being a guest twice on his 1440 charity maker's dreams. In the interest of transparency, here's how the relationship went. I was able to vent and give feedback directly to Prusa through Shane. He made suggestions on the type of things I could do to get the printer as I wanted. He investigated upgrades and modifications I was considering. I was offered a free set of 0.4mm nozzles, but I had already purchased them anyway. And most significantly, I was offered a brand new Prusa XL, updated to the latest spec for me to test and compare free of charge. However, I declined this as all I wanted to do was get my paid printer working like it should. Something Shane suggested that I want to talk about is filament dryness, because Prusa made this video advertising the XL being used without any waste tower, simply by drying the filament. I don't really like this as a catch-all solution for print problems, and here's why. It's been another very wet summer where I live, and this is not great for humidity or filament dryness. But despite this, my other printers have not been giving me any problems with stringing. In my initial tests, I used the exact same spools of filament, and only the XL suffered from stringing. And here's another example. The print on the left was done on the Magneto X without any tuning of the firmware or slicer. It's far from perfect, but there's no stringing. And here's the exact part, printed with the exact same spool of filament on the Prusa XL. You can see the problem here. The problem is not my filament dryness, the problem is the XL. Dry filament is always ideal, but if only one printer needs it, then perhaps the printer is the problem and not the filament. And as it turns out, I didn't need to dry my filament in the end. Let's have a look at what I did need to do. Step one for me was some preventative maintenance, as the tool posts are only held on by a single bolt, and previously I'd already had one of them vibrate loose. So I took the time to pull each one of them out, 
accidentally put on way too much Loctite, and then torque them back up, hopefully to stay that way. This of course then required me to rerun some calibration, specifically the dock position calibration. To do this for each tool head takes a little under 5 minutes, so I'll be glad to not have to do it again. One persistent problem I was having was failed prints due to a nozzle cleaning error in the start G-code sequence. Typically, I would manually pull any filament off the nozzle, restart the print and it would complete. But then for the next print, it would happen again and this was pretty annoying. It was suggested that I remove these printed lead screw guides to see if that improved matters. And it was after that that we realised there was quite a lot of wobble on the left hand Z lead screw, causing some horrible vibration when the bed went down. So I removed the left hand lead screw and jogged it back and forth off the machine to verify that it wasn't bent. I reassembled everything but then made a silly mistake, running the Z alignment calibration without those plastic printed pieces in place. This lifts the bed so high that the linear rails exposed the ball bearings and some of them fell out. Fortunately with some perseverance I did manage to repack them. I guess something was misaligned and that's disappointing considering I paid extra for the fully assembled version. Next up this fan shroud remix by Livius. And I wanted to test the performance of this back to back but my part cooling torture test model just refused to complete successfully with the printer stock. The reason I wanted to change is best shown in the pictures on this page. As you can see, the standard duct is pretty simplistic, and for me, it was close enough to the silicon sock that I had trouble sliding the sock on. If nothing else, this new duct would at least follow the alignment of the heater block. Fitting it is super easy. There's two bolts that need to be undone. We slide out the old duct and replace it with the new one, and do back up those two same bolts. It only takes around a minute for each tool head. I did do a before and after water test. Here's the standard duct looking pretty reasonable, and here's the aftermarket duct looking much the same. Shane said they tested this and didn't find any improvement, so this perhaps validates that. But as I said, I was happy to fit it just to optimise the packaging around the silicon sock. And no, the torture test still wouldn't complete with this duct and the standard 0.6mm nozzle. So how about the most important thing, the 0.4mm nozzles? Prusa have a page for this process, which I followed all of the steps for. Changing each nozzle is fairly straightforward. Not quite E3D Revo or Bamboo Lab A1 quick swap easy, but still not particularly complicated. We take the cover off the electronics for that head, unplug two wires, and then guide the old nozzle and heater block assembly with the wires out. We then use the tools that came with the printer to unscrew the old nozzle before inserting the new one, torquing it up, and repeating all of the steps from earlier in reverse. We then verify everything is still connected properly by heating up the hot ends to a high temperature. We tell the firmware that we've changed our nozzle size down to 0.4mm and then we rerun the tool offset calibration with this sequence taking 15 to 20 minutes for all 5 tools. My nozzle sealing was already pretty good but I took the time to adjust each one and get them great and something Shane suggested was lubricating the docking pins using this printed part available with the other printable parts for the XL on printables. To do this, we remove each tool, clean the pins, and then apply some of the lubricant that came with the printer, being sure to clean off any excess. Following this, I docked and undocked each of the tools just to help spread the lubricant around. I've never had the problem that this is meant to fix, but it seems like it didn't hurt since I was doing all of the other jobs. The last thing I did was upgrade to the latest stable firmware at the time of recording 5.1.2. I also changed the latest stable version of Prusa Slicer and switched over to the 0.4mm nozzle profiles. That was everything and fortunately for me, the cumulative effect was significant. I started off with a simple 3D Benchy, all default profiles in the slicer. And for generic PLA, that means 220 degrees for the hot end, and as you can see that makes a shiny print, but also one with some fine stringing. So I dropped it down to 190, which I was running earlier, and this pretty much fixed the problem. There's some strange surface artifacts, more on that later, but I was definitely happy enough with this to proceed. I also re-sliced the part cooling torture test, and for the first time on the XL, I managed to get it to complete without failure. Time to repeat some of the multicolor testing from my original video. This sushi has some wisp coming off the wipe tower, but not the model. Last time with the exact same filament, there was lots of contaminated color blobs as well as stringing, but this time round, the result was clean and I would say flawless. So how about that four color Marlin torture test? To make it like that, I scale it down to around 42%, and obviously I do it with 4 colours, and that's what gives all of the tiny little segments that make this difficult to print. 
Again, there was a bit of stringing between the model and the wipe tower, but honestly, compared to what I was getting before, it's a million times better and simple enough to remove it by hand. There's a few errant wisps that contaminated the underside, but on balance, I'd say this is pretty much on par with the reference model I was printing on the Bamboo Lab A1 Mini. I made this four color Miami Heat logo keyring for my daughter, and in my opinion, it's flawless, and I did these boxing gloves, a previous test model that I used for the palette too. This one needed support material, so some of the purging went into that, reducing the wipe tower size. The end result is nice and clean, and it's the first time I've printed this model without any color bleed in the red. But easily my favorite is this beautiful Mandalorian bust by Icy's Fires. This was a nice test because it was a long print in 14 hours, used four colors, and had lots of little details. Again, some minor stringing, mostly off the model instead of on it, but after cleaning this up with my fingers, plus a torch to get the hard to reach areas, we end up with a pretty solid result. It's not perfect, but I can't do this print this efficiently on any other printer that I own. And this is why I purchased the XL. I wanted a printer that could do multicolor and multi-material without so much waste. I'm going to try some tuning to improve this even further, but already it's way ahead of something like a Bamboo Lab AMS, especially when we factor in time. This is something I've made a video on in the past, and for this same benchmark, the model weighs the same, but takes an extra six hours to print and uses 13 times the filament waste. So that's a win for multicolor. Multi-material didn't go as well. I tried to recreate my 4D printing test model that uses PLA, TPU, and then some dissolvable support material. Therefore, when you drop it in hot water, these bonds dissolve and it transforms from a straight line to a three-dimensional cube. The dissolvable filament is really soft and that makes it a nightmare to load on the XL. I couldn't get it past the initial filament sensor without partially disassembling it. And then we have the long hard slog of pushing it through the long lengths of PTFE tube. And when it finally reaches the tool head, Again, we need to pull things apart and assist with the loading before we're able to print. And then after a couple of layers, the dissolvable filament jammed in the tool head anyway. So at the moment, regular TPU plus a rigid filament is entirely workable. But to print something really soft, I think I'm going to have to bypass the filament sensor on the side and come up with a custom spool mount above that feeds directly into the tool head to bypass all of that tube. Plus I'll probably need to do some tuning. So still some stringing compared to my other printers, but within my personal tolerance. Now I wanted to bring the printer up to modern standards. Previously, I complained about the lack of integrated camera and proper web control, particularly on such an expensive flagship printer. For web control, we have the LAN only Prusa link, and I would describe this as limited. And then we have the cloud-based Prusa Connect. This is much better, but in my opinion, still lacking basic features. Let me show you how I think things should be with Octoprint, which I've now set up. Firstly, I have a real-time camera feed with a reasonable frame rate, and with that, the ability to take time lapses as I print. I have a console where I can directly send G-code that's missing in the Prusa offerings, as is a temperature plot that shows more than one nozzle at a time. Update, this has just been added as I finish editing. Plus, we have a comprehensive ability to customize both the appearance and the functionality with the rich plugin library of Octoprint. And of course, I can choose to do all of this from my computer or from my phone with one of the many Octoprint apps available, this particular app being Octo Remote. The printer is much more user-friendly like this, but I hate the fact I had to spend extra money to add functionality that comes standard on a much, much cheaper hardware. Just quickly, a new alpha firmware just came out for the XL. Its big improvement is phase stepping. I was hoping it would reduce noise, but apparently that's still to come. But what it does do is improve print quality and reduce noise on surfaces. Once flashed, I ran the new calibration item from the menu. This moves the steppers back and forth, taking measurements, and afterwards reports improvements. At this stage, I don't think it's any quieter. I also can't see any reduction in the surface artifacts on this before and after benchy, but it's only an alpha version, so maybe things will improve. So let's get to the big question. Now that I'm more or less happy with my Excel, would I recommend it to others? This printer cost me a lot of money. I've only ever spent more in my life on things like houses and cars. And unfortunately, due to a lack of competition with tool changer 3D printers, Prusa can pretty much charge what they want. Personally, I've been unhappy with the state of the printer when it was finally delivered, with mine suffering from excessive stringing and a lot of cross-contamination blobs. I've also had problems with layer shifts, dislodged prime towers, unreliable start G-code sequences, and at times, unstable firmware. 
And as I showed in my first Excel video, there's been plenty of people suffering from the same type of thing. My problems certainly aren't isolated. And then there's some frequent problems which fortunately I didn't suffer from, like first layer inconsistency, some tools simply not extruding on a multicolor print, a misalignment of the tool after being picked up, poor layer stacking, and the most terrifying, a tool being dropped mid-print, with the worst thing being that the printer didn't seem to detect this and just kept going. And to be fair, there's plenty of people in the comments saying theirs has been working the whole time, so hopefully that's the vast majority of users. But if we're honest, I think enough people have experienced problems that it's clear that Excel was launched before it was ready. But even for those who have had nice prints from the start, other aspects have been lacking. Let's consider that many printers shipped without input shaping, came with a suboptimal nozzle, had abysmally slow Wi-Fi speeds until binary G-code was introduced, the Perch Tower logic was quite flawed until after I received my printer, and I would add that Prusa Link and Connect seem to be early in development, and this is particularly a problem since Octoprint integration was broken for some time. And finally, there's some things that still aren't in place, like the ability to print with mixed nozzle sizes. I think a powerful use case is to have a mix of nozzle sizes across the five tools. Imagine on a model like this, printing the solid pieces from the larger nozzle to save time, the majority with the standard nozzle, and the fine details with a smaller nozzle to help with precision. But hey, this is not my idea, this was one of the things mentioned in the launch blog years ago. To me this felt like a AAA video game. Delays and then a full price tag when you purchase it, and then you gotta sit back and wait for key features and functionality to be added over time. And now that mine is working, I would tentatively recommend the XL for those wanting efficient, multicolor or multi-material printing. But I would add that there's been a high cost to this printer in more ways than one. Based on my experiences with the XL and my early mini, I would not recommend being an early adopter for whatever printer Prusa released next. Despite my frustrations, I still have a soft spot for Prusa and I'm very appreciative of Shane and the rest of the Prusa support team. Support is probably the best thing Prusa has going for it at the moment. Let me know if you agree and what you think about the Prusa XL. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy trouble free 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.